All right. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Christopher Urbane from the AFT Inspection Division. I'm the webinar coordinator for this event. Our speaker today is Dave Northcutt. Dave Northcutt is a retired industrial statistician. Uh, he is also an IBM Distinguished Engineer specializing in statistics. He has multiple degrees including a master's degree in statistics, a master's degree in computer science, and a master's in economics. Um, Dave has specialized in statistical processes and methods throughout his career. With that being said, Dave, I'd like to have you take over the webinar to begin the presentation. For those of you in the audience, we will take questions and answers in the chat window, and we will get to them in the order they were received at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dave. All right, very good. Thank you, Chris, and, and welcome, everyone. I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, join tonight, and uh, I hope you find this to be a, a valuable use of your time. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic uh, today that I've been uh, studying for many years, and uh, I uh, have found this to be very, very useful uh, concept in a lot of my work. So uh, I want to start out with a caveat. The, the title is not mine. It's not original. Uh, in about three slides, I think, we'll uh, talk about who this, who came up with this term to begin with. But uh, I find it very appropriate. And uh, the cartoon is actually his as well. So uh, we'll get to that very shortly. So let's see here. Uh, Next page. Come on. There we go. Uh, this is the agenda we're going to follow tonight. I'll do a brief overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we often do estimation. And uh, this may not fit everyone, and some folks may be uh, at higher levels of maturity on this uh, continuum. But I've found that uh, for a lot of organizations, this is pretty much how it works. Uh, I'm going to do an example that I think you'll find hits real close to home, given uh, some of the current things that have been going on in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding variation and uh, the need to acknowledge it. And then we're going to get into the meat of the, the concept, and that is create estimates that reflect the variation. I've got a couple of examples. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what it takes to actually get started doing this yourself. So from an overview standpoint, I don't think it's any uh, surprise to anyone that estimation is a necessary part of just about every important business endeavor. We're asked to do time estimates, cost estimates, resource estimates, revenue estimates, and lots of other estimates, I'm sure, in, in different lines of work. Uh, but these four tend to show up an awful lot. I claim that in spite of the importance in general, we often do a poor job of estimating. And I would argue that examples are numerous in virtually every business. And so I, I think this raises a fundamental question. Is it, is it just our estimates that are bad? Or are the methods that we use to generate them flawed? And that, that's a, a very important difference. And we'll come back to that uh, over and over as we go through the discussion here. So here's how I would uh, propose that we often do estimation. Many of our estimation methods rely on using averages of historical data for input. Uh, it's not uncommon when I work with other teams, other companies, uh, clients all over, uh, I find them you know, going through their data and finding the historical averages and using those as estimates to go forward. On the surface, that probably sounds like a reasonable idea. We're going to talk at some length here in just a few slides why that's not a good idea. Um, just as a kind of a, a, a teaser here, little or no formal analysis typically goes into the generation of these averages. They're often adversely affected by outliers or erratic properties in the underlying data. Uh, it's not at all uncommon to find averages that when you uh, look at the underlying data, they're, they're you know, heavily influenced by one or a very small number of large outliers. 
And so uh, if we don't look at those, we don't realize that that's having a big impact. Um, what happens with the averages? Then they're typically used as input to spreadsheet models. Unfortunately, by their very nature, spreadsheet models are static analytical tools. Uh, in fact, that's why we like spreadsheets, because if you put the same thing in it two times in a row, you'll get the same answer back out. That's a very valuable trait for a lot of things. Unfortunately, for estimation, we really want to understand more about the random and chance nature of, of the thing we're estimating, and that's very difficult to do with a standard spreadsheet. We often only generate a single scenario to arrive at the required estimate. Uh, I see this a lot as well when I work with folks. They, uh, they've got a spreadsheet, maybe an elaborate spreadsheet, lots of inputs, lots of formulas, lots of cells, and one answer at the bottom. Well, there's almost no chance that that answer is going to be the exact answer that, that comes out in real life. And so, there we go. Uh, that leaves us with a dilemma that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. When multiple scenarios are generated, I usually only see at best a best case, an average case, and a worst case, and still no, no real indication of, well, you know, how likely is the best one, how likely is the worst one, how likely is the average, and what about all those points in between those, those three? So, unfortunately, there's a, a, a truism that we're going to come across here very soon, is that plans based on average assumptions are rarely correct. And real-world variability is the culprit. And that variability is what causes so many plans to not uh, pan out. So here's an example that hits close to home. And, and here's the credit I'm, I'm going to give. Uh, this example was actually first uh, done by a professor, Sam Savage. Uh, he was a professor at uh, Stanford University. I think he's still a, a, uh, an emeritus professor there, although I don't believe he's still teaching regularly. Uh, this was published in 2000 in the San Jose Mercury News. And the, uh, the example is very simple. So suppose you have $200,000 in your retirement fund, and you want to know how much you can withdraw each year and have it last 20 years. And uh, hence the, the title, it hits close to home. I, we've all just been through an amazing period in the, in the uh, stock market here. And uh, I'm sure more than a few of us are probably looking over our shoulders at uh, you know, whether we're in the same position we thought we were just a few months ago. If you look at the historical data, and I said this was originally published in 2000, so it's uh, you know it could stand to be updated perhaps, but I suspect, quite honestly, that the averages uh, are not going to be that far off. But since its inception in 1952 until 2000, the Standard and Poor's 500 index has varied, but it's averaged about 14% per year. So let's use that as the average growth. Well, you can go to a standard annuity tool like in Excel. There's a number of different formulas in Excel that will, you know, figure this out for you very quickly. You can easily figure out that you should be able to withdraw, withdraw about $32,000 per year and have your money last for 20 years. Clearly, the return will fluctuate over this period, but as long as the average is 14%, you should be okay, right? Well, it turns out the answer is wrong. Uh, given typical levels of volatility in the stock market, there are only slim odds that your retirement fund will last for 20 years. And uh, what Dr. Savage did was he went back and looked at historical 20-year periods starting in 1973, 74, 75, and 76. And you can see the summarized results here. Um, <clears throat> in three of those four years, the average return on all four of them was well over, was 14% or better. Um, but yet three of those four starting points, the, the money did not even come close to lasting 20 years. In fact, if it started in 1973, it lasted only eight years. In 1974, the average return, 15.4%, uh, it was still solvent after 20 years. 
Yet in 75, with the same average return for 20 years, it lasted only 13 years. So it kind of makes you wonder what's going on. The average return for all these periods was at least 14%. The average return for a 20-year interval is not a good predictor of success, though. And uh, as you can see, three out of the four of these did not did not last. So what really drives the result, as it turns out, is getting off to a good start. And that's what sets 1974 apart from the rest. It turns out that in that particular 20-year span, that, that, uh, that investment happened to get off to a very good start. And so it weathered the storm for the, the 20 years. The other three years did not get off to as good a start. And uh, we see the results that, that it uh, generated. So why doesn't this work? What, what about this? What, what is fundamentally, what are we missing here, I guess, is probably the, the best question. So why don't average inputs yield average results? Well, this is the, this is the caveat uh, slide for the, for the uh, session. I'm going to do, just talk a little bit about some mathematics here. But I promise I won't jump in real deep, but I, it's an important concept that, that I think we all need to take away here. Um, there's a little bit of background. Any result that depends on random variable inputs is known as a function of random variables. And in general, the general rule that can be proven is that using average values for uncertain inputs in a function of random variables does not result in the average value of the function itself. And in mathematical terms, we can write that as follows here, that the function of the expected values is not equal to the expected value of the function. All right. So using average values, as it turns out, will only yield the average result when the function is a linear function of random variables, which is almost never the case in real world situations in complex spreadsheets. If you've got a spreadsheet in it with any conditional logic, it's not linear. If you've got a real world situation where any of your inputs are not linear inputs, then the model that you've built is not linear. A uh, really good example I, I like to use, and I think most of us uh, in, in the quality field could certainly relate to this. Um, suppose your boss comes to you and says, we're going to build a new line out on the floor. And uh, I need to know how big to make it. Uh, go back and look at the data for demand for the last three years and come back and tell me how big this should be. And so you go off and you come back and you say, boss, I looked at the demand and uh, it ranges anywhere from 75 units to 125 units uh, on a given month. The boss looks at you and says, I can't build a factory that generates different units. I, I need to pick a number. Tell me what we need to do. So we look at it and you say, well, the average is 100. So let's build the factory. So are you going to then, is, suppose you make a dollar on every item that comes out of the factory, just to keep the math simple here. On average, the demand is 100 per month. You get a dollar. Will you see a dollar, $100 in revenue on average over the months? And the answer is absolutely not. And the, the reason is because you just built a nonlinearity into your, into your uh, solution. And that nonlinearity is if you build that factory to, to make 100 maximum a month, you've just lost the upside potential on that factory. So every month where the demand is over that, you can't realize that. Every month where it's under, you're going to get whatever is presented. And so the average is going to be well below 100 over time, probably in the low 90s or even the high 80s, depending on, you know, the shape of your demand function and things like that. So nonlinearity is, is the real culprit here. Um, and then also, even when the problem is linear, simply knowing the average result is really of little value if you don't also know the likely deviation from that average. It's very unlikely that the final outcome will be exactly the average value, even in a linear system. And so it's really important to understand. So 
what are the ranges and what are the likelihoods that go with those ranges? So in order to, to get our hands around this, we really need to understand and acknowledge variation. And I, I add that and acknowledging uh, as, as a major point here because I find I have found through my career that getting people to acknowledge the variation is probably one of the biggest parts of the battle. Uh, and so even when it's staring them in the face a lot of times, they they don't really want to acknowledge that, that they need to deal with that. Um, so before we can account for the effects of variability, we have to acknowledge and understand that variability. Obviously, real-world data are variable. There are two types of variation. And again, being you know, a quality group, uh, this should be kind of secondhand for a lot of folks, I would think, uh, common cause and special cause variation. And they must be correctly identified as they have very different effects on a system. And complex systems contain many sources of variation that may need to be accounted for. So this becomes a challenge, uh, quite honestly, for building good estimation models is making sure you capture and can somehow quantify, and we'll talk about the somehow in a minute, the variation. The process that I've been using for years and, and have used with a number of, of uh, teams and we've had very good luck with is our old friend statistical process control. It's been shown to be an effective method for understanding variation and also for separating common cause from special cause variation. It can be used to first determine if your data per, are predictable. And what does predictable mean? It means that it only has common cause variation, right? If you have data that is exhibiting special cause variation, it's not predictable. If it's not predictable, then it really doesn't work well as an input into models because it, it, it's not predictable. It's kind of definitional there. So you need to understand that if your data aren't predictable, you first need to be able to identify and either remove or control somehow the special cause variation. Then we can determine the expected amount of variability in your data, and you can then finally determine if your data can be represented by a simple probability distribution or a, mo a more complex one. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. So here's an example. Question is, are the following data predictable? And if so, what is the extent of the likely variability? Well, I don't know about you, but I can't just look at those numbers and tell you whether they're predictable. I need some sort of visual help with that. And so we build an SPC chart to help us answer those questions. And here's a simple individual and moving range chart for this time series data that helps us understand whether these data are predictable. And the chart, by the definition of how we interpret those, indicate that this data is predictable. The average is 17.7, and the likely range is between 5.9 and 29.5. So right off the bat, with a very simple analysis, we've, we're starting to get a sense that there's a lot of variability in this data. When you've got a number that averages 17 and can range anywhere from 5.9 to 29.5, that's quite a bit of variability. That's going to be present in any estimate that you make, whether you acknowledge it or not, it's going to be present in the, in the system. So the chart virtually forces us to acknowledge and deal with the variability in the data. As I said, I've been using these for many years with a lot of teams, and there's always education, training, whatever you like to call it, up front to help people understand how to, how to read these and how to interpret them. But once they do, I've found that it, it helps uh, tremendously in focusing the, the analysis, focusing the, the approach, focusing the questions you get, and helping keep people grounded. So then we need to create estimates that reflect the variation. Once that variation for each of the input factors is understood, it's possible to use that to create better estimates. So, if you've been waiting for the punchline, here, here's the punchline. Um, what we're really talking about here is doing Monte Carlo simulation. 
that allows us to build dynamic models, often from existing static models. In fact, uh, more times than not, when I've done this with new groups, we start with their spreadsheet models. And we make them dynamic. And we replace fixed assumptions with random inputs that we can specify and control. These can be chosen from a variety of distributions that represent our best estimates of the shapes and ranges of those inputs. And one of the things that's really nice about this technique is it's relatively insensitive to the underlying distributional assumptions. Now that doesn't mean that if you've got some crazy distribution with a, a very long tail or a, you know, a high point that's somewhere way off center or something like that, that you can ignore that. But what it means is that we can do things like take data that are reasonably normal and represent them with a triangular distribution and get pretty much the same kinds of answers we're going to get uh, if we use more sophisticated distributions. And so that, that makes it very easy to uh, move forward quickly. These completed models are then run for many iterations. And basically, uh, the, the software that does these uh, this modeling takes your spreadsheet and it just keeps hitting F9 for those of you that are familiar with Excel over and over and over again. But every time it does that, there's a different random variable uh, in each of those random input cells and it gets a different answer. And it keeps track of all those answers and it ends up building a histogram of the results. And then these data allow us to compute the likelihood of any outcome from the model. I said most Monte Carlo tools are simply add-ins to Microsoft Excel. It makes it easy to enhance existing static models or create new ones. So here's kind of a, a picture of the way the, the method flows. We start by determining the inputs and the outcomes. They may be time, effort, money, quality, any number of things. Basically, if, if you're estimating it today, with a static approach, you can estimate it tomorrow with a dynamic approach. Then we consider the variation. And these are four of the most common distributions that we use, uh, probably not in necessarily the right order. Um, tend to use the triangular one a lot. Uh, if the, the uh, normal distribution is uh, taller and skinnier, if the data indicate that, then we'll take the effort often to go to a normal distribution, uh, uniform distribution where things are equally likely, and log normal handles most of the cases where we've got long tails on one end or the other. Um, all of these distributions are programmed for you into these software packages. So, you know, you don't have to generate log normal random variables on your own. You just need to use the built-in function, tell it what the mean and the standard deviation are, and it'll go off and do all this for you. It's, it's uh, very, very handy. Then you define the relationships. Maybe a simple model, profit equals revenue minus cost, um, which is actually not unlike the one we talked about earlier with the, the production line. That would have been a very simple model to write, at least at a, at a high level, certainly high enough to help you be able to validate that you'll never get average inputs from that model because it, uh, it has nonlinearity. And then you try it 10,000 times, 100,000 times. Uh, when I first started doing this, we had to be really careful with big models and at that time relatively slow laptops because it could take hours to generate answers sometimes. And we had to find clever ways to to uh, speed things up or take shortcuts and, and do sampling and things like that. With today's processors and memory, that's almost never a problem anymore. Uh, these things can run through 10,000, 100,000 iterations in a matter of you know, a couple of seconds in most cases. And then finally, we review the results. And I'll, I'm gonna talk about this exact example that generated this chart, so I'm not gonna talk to it right now. But very straightforward methodology, uh, not very difficult to do, not very time consuming, but the change in insight is nothing short of dramatic.
So with a single point estimate, there's little insight into the nature of the expected results. With Monte Carlo simulation, the possible outcomes and the respective likelihoods are generated through repeated sampling, giving a view of the range of possibilities. So here's the, uh, the uh, simulation that goes with the example that uh, I showed you at the beginning about the re retirement plan, all right? And so now it, it's quite possible to see, first of all, the average over many, many runs of this. Uh, and this was done by giving it the actual uh, market returns each year for all those different years and their relative frequencies and sampling out of that over and over and over again. Um, you can see that the average number of years that that, uh, that initial investment would have lasted was less than 14. Um, you can see that the cumulative frequency at 20 years is still less than 70%. So that means that there's less than probably a 35% chance that the money would last 20 years, all right? So I don't know about you, but that would certainly give me a lot of pause if I were working with a financial planner that were simply using annuity models or you know, any of the, the kinds of formulas that uh, you know, Excel can use to tell you how long the money should last. It's interesting to note here is, is the, the, uh, num the, the relatively high percentage, I think, of times that the money doesn't even last six years. Um, you know, you're up over 5% there. Uh, and it just goes to show that it, you know, it wouldn't take a real long sustained downturn to uh, run through that money pretty quickly. So let's look at a different kind of example because this is something that I think a lot of folks uh, probably deal with on a regular basis, and that's estimating project timeline risk. Uh, project timelines are a common place where we often use static or near static assumptions. Uh, you know, the, uh, the critical path through a, through a project timeline uh, is a pretty standard approach that a lot of folks use. Each task is given an expected duration and perhaps a worst case duration. And, uh, you know, we look at the critical path. In reality, the time to complete any task has a range of outcomes. And all of the task ranges really need to be considered to understand the risk. Some tasks are related, and the, the technical term there in statistics is correlated as well. And that's another aspect I'm not going to talk about a lot tonight, but uh, it's possible to deal with those correlations in these Monte Carlo packages as well. So that if one of your uh, random variable inputs uh, is tracks in the same direction as another one, and you can establish that correlation through your data, then you can make sure that those get tied together in your simulation because to not account for that would obviously give you, uh, you know, less, uh, less optimal results. Um, to compound the problem, and I'm sure we've all been here, I'm probably preaching to the choir, right? Uh, task estimates are often optimistic, and when they're aggregated, they give an overall estimate that is very unlikely. If you take an optimistic estimate at every point, and then you put them all together to come up with your project timeline, the probability that every one of those tasks is gonna come in at the optimistic time is very low. And this methodology will show that very quickly, actually. But what we do is we replace these static estimates with probabilistic ones, use the Monte Carlo approach, and it allows us to estimate the likelihood of the project being completed within any given time frame. Uh, I think this kind of information is invaluable when you're trying to manage multiple projects as a portfolio. And that's one of the other things that these tools are very good at typically now. They weren't when they first came out, but uh, today they are. You can take multiple uh, models and put them all together and see what the overall answers look like with all the submodels uh, working independently or if they have correlations. So a lot of flexibility here. Let's look at a, 
a very simple project timeline. Here's a project with what, five tasks. And uh, if you look through this and you use the times and, and see there's only two paths here, right? A, B, C, E, and A, B, D, E. And it turns out since D is twice as long as C and that's the only uh, place where there's any choice, the critical path here is A, B, D, E, and the total time is 15 weeks. Um, so I replaced each static estimate with a distribution of times, with the estimates above being most likely, but somewhat optimistic, all right? So essentially what I did was I used triangular distributions for all five of these tasks. The peak was the most likely, which was the time in here, but it was slightly to the left of center in the distribution, all right? So that made it somewhat optimistic. Turns out the total time exceeds 15 weeks most of the time. And the project would almost certainly be late using the static estimate. In fact, if you look at this cumulative distribution and you find where 15 is, uh, and it, it's not exactly on there, but I can see where 15.3 is, and if I come up there and, and look at where that intersects the curve, it looks like at best I've got about a 15% chance of this project coming in on time, all right? So if we do this same approach, the non-probabilistic approach, over and over and over again all the time, and this is a reasonably representative type of approach, I think you could see why we we tend to get the uh, we tend to get the reputation of our projects are always late, right? Because there's almost no chance that they're going to make meet the estimates given the way we're doing the estimating. So how does this work? As I said earlier, the the Excel add-in allows us to replace standard deterministic formulas with probabilistic formulas. For example. Instead of having a cell that says that the total time in the previous example is A plus B plus D plus E, where those are the cells with the static values and we know that that's the critical path, we can say that the total time is actually the max of A, B, C, E or A, B, D, E. Because if you think about it, if we're putting probability distributions into each of these cells, there will be times when the upper path is actually longer than the lower path, the one going through C, because C might have a longer time in some of the probability sampling than D will. And so we need to account for that, and that's why when we go to that, we need to change some of the formulas so that we, uh, we you know, capture the right thing. These were actually the, the uh, values I used. You can see on a triangular distribution, the, the, it's defined by three values, the left endpoint, the high point, and the right endpoint. And so you can see that uh, in every case here, I've got the, the midpoint just uh, left of center. In other words, there's a little more space between the first two points and the second and third point. So the software then runs the model thousands of times, keeps track of each result, and generates a cumulative distribution of the outcomes. And that's the chart we just saw a couple of pages back. It's just a little bigger here so you can look at it. Um, you know, if you're looking to give an estimate that says, you know, we're reasonably likely to to hit this estimate or, you know, hit it or do better, uh, you know, even at even at 80%, you're looking at 17.3 weeks roughly there. 90%, um, you're looking at uh, about 18 weeks as an estimate. I don't know about, you know, you or, or, or your, you know, the organizations that you work with, but most of the, the managers that I've talked to you know, find having this sort of insight very valuable. Uh, we all know that there are still reasons why organizations make suboptimal choices 
and insist on going with, you know, shorter deadlines and we'll, we'll find some way to pull this out, et cetera, et cetera. But even then, it, it's really good to have, you know, gone on record and saying, you know, look, you're taking a risk. You need to at least uh, be made aware of that, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. So I think it's a fair question to ask if, if this is overly simplistic. One of my favorite quotes is from a statistician that's uh, quite famous. His name's George Fox. And George used to say, all models are wrong. Some are useful. And uh, what I found with all of this is we've obviously oversimplified things. There are a lot of factors. You can never capture them all. And in fact, you can very quickly get to the point of diminishing marginal returns trying to chase all the, the little uh, details on some of these things. Um, but my experience has been that these models are extremely useful. And, you know, is the 90th percentile point really at 18.27 weeks or is it more like 18.5 weeks or 17.98 weeks? Don't know. Uh, not sure it's worth the time to try to figure that out unless the, the uh, project you're working on is got, you know, people's lives at stake, and then maybe you do need to use more detail. But the point is, the, the insight and the, uh, the, the ability to understand the variation and the likely outcomes uh, at this level is just so much more than you have with, well, the Gantt chart said 15 weeks, so that's the answer. So, uh, yes, it's simplistic, but you know, any model by its nature is an abstraction of the reality it claims to represent. The goal is to capture the essential factors that have the biggest effect. Some detail is going to be lost. Uh, two steps that are always important. First is verification, ensuring that the model works as advertised. Uh, and so it's like anything else. Uh, if you're going to use it, you really need to test it and make sure it it passes the sniff test or the red face test or whichever one you like. Um, I, I'm, I do a lot of work with folks that have spreadsheets and for just all sorts of things. And it's always amazed me how many people don't realize that a spreadsheet is a software project. Uh, and the biggest thing it has in common with most software projects is it's got bugs. And so anytime you use spreadsheets, you really need a testing approach to try to find those bugs and, and try to get rid of them. So verification is important and validation is important, ensuring that the model gives accurate predictions. Um, how do you do that? Well, one of the easiest ways is to go back with your models and say, can I predict the past with past data? And uh, that was, that's a very important step as well. Uh, another way to do it, uh, which is fairly common in the AI uh, world, is to break your data up into two pieces. Build the model with one and then run it on, on the part you didn't use and see if it holds together. If it does, then you can be pretty sure that you've got a, a good model. If it doesn't, then you need to go back and, and try to understand what you may have overlooked or what may have been different. Um, making the variability in the process and the resulting estimations explicit is the big value of this method. We don't tend to think probabilistically. Um, and and I, I realize I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here, and I, I suspect a lot of the audience tonight thinks probabilistic, uh, probabilistically a lot of the time. But I would argue that I suspect most of your organizations fall short in this category. And this is a, a tool that you can use to help uh, enlighten folks. So we go through the summary here, and then we'll do some do some uh, Q and A. Uh, first point here, because we often fail to identify and account for the variability that's naturally a part of the estimation process. Our estimates fail to provide us with the insight we need to make sound business decisions. Statistical process control can help us to better understand the nature of the variation. There are lots of other methods out there to try to understand variation, but quite honestly, this has stood the test of time. This was developed in the 1920s, 
and it still works extremely well uh, and, and it's easy to use. That's the advantage. When Walter Schuhart developed this, there were no calculators. Uh, the people in the factories had no slide rules, uh, but they were still able to maintain these charts on, on the sides of their, uh, their, their equipment. Monte Carlo simulation can then allow us to incorporate that variation into all of our systems it's in all of our systems into the estimation process. Then the output for that is a range of estimates and the associated likelihoods. And to me, this is, this is the real value, is to be able to see that you're talking about something that uh, by its very nature has a random component, and we're trying to get our hands around that and understand what does that mean for the decisions we're about to try to make. And that leads to the final point. The result is much more insight into the nature of the situation and the opportunity to make informed decisions. So how can you implement Monte Carlo simulation? Uh, I'm just going to uh, go through this somewhat quickly here because I'm keeping an eye on the time. To get started, you need a tool that allows you to build Monte Carlo simulations. Here are three software packages, and uh, the slides will be available afterwards, and uh, this is also being recorded. So, um, you know, either way, you should be able to have these. You don't, you don't need to copy everything down. Uh, the first one there is called SIPMath. This is Sam Savage's tool set. set. Um, this is a second iteration for him. Uh, the first one was very good. This one is just phenomenal. Uh, and the price is really right. It's free. The models you build are shareable, which means that the people you give them to don't have to have the software uh, installed in their in their uh, copy of Excel in order to be able to to see the results and and work with them. Uh, that's a huge step forward. Uh, the other two, Crystal Ball and At Risk, they've been around for a long time. Some of you may be using them for other things. Uh, they're both commercial licensed products. They both have very good feature sets. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is they don't meet that it's free category up there on the that SIPMAP has. So uh, it really just kind of comes down to, you know, what works well for you. How can you implement this? There are a lot of helpful tutorials on the internet. I recommend you go out to probabilitymanagement.org, which is Sam Savage's website. He has lots of examples, lots of uh, models that you can use and enhance and, you know, pick apart and figure out how they work, et cetera. There's just a lot of good stuff out there. Some good introductory references. Uh, the first one I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, that's Donald Wheeler's Understanding Variation. Uh, if you're not uh, real familiar with SPC or it's something you don't use a lot, uh, this is a great place to start, uh, go back, brush up a little bit. Uh, it's a great book. I, I always have several copies on my desk so that I can give one to anybody that I think really needs it. Um, they're also easy to find used on Amazon, so uh, you can get them for a you know, very reasonable price. Uh, Savage actually wrote a book in 2012 called The Flaw of Averages. has lots of examples. It's easy to read. Uh, he goes into, obviously, much more detail. He wrote a book. I uh, just talked for 45 minutes, so uh, I highly recommend that. If you really want to get into simulation, uh, the third reference here is uh, much more academic treatment, but it's a very valuable reference. Uh, if you get into this on a, you know, a serious scale, I, I recommend it as a kind of a reference book in your library. So with that, uh, Chris, I'm going to kind of hand it back to you. I want to thank everyone for attending, and let's take some questions. If you have questions later, I'm happy to have you uh, send them to me. I'll do my best to answer what I can or point you to someone else who can. That's great. Thank you, Dave. I uh, really appreciate it that, that you did a great presentation, and you already answered two of the questions I had, which was uh, what kind of software to use and uh, your contact information. So that, that's great so people can follow up if they have any questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll give everybody a few minutes to, if they want to type any questions into the questions box. Uh, I see a couple of questions coming in now. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. I, I started brewing beer recently. If anybody's ever tried to do that, it's it's a little bit more difficult than buying a box. And your standard and poor's example was almost exactly, uh, you know, that the flaw of averages you talked about with that is almost exactly the same relation as pitching feast, or pitching the yeast into an early fermentation. So the temperature and the, the pitch rate yep. is most important in the beginning. So yeah, if anybody's I, ever brewed beer, they can relate to that. I uh, I started doing sourdough bread when I retired, and uh, very similar thing, right? There, there's a lot of variables, and uh, you know it it uh, it takes a it takes a while to get your hands around all of them, and sometimes you still don't you know remember that oh yeah, it was doing this this morning, that's why it's not doing what it ought to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, most important thing is that the first hour or so, though. All right, there's a couple of questions coming in here. Um, first one says, what type of graph was generated after the simulation that had the cumulative frequency on the ordinate axis? I think that's relative to one of the, the slides that you showed. Yeah, let me, uh, I think the question's probably about this one, right? This actually came out of uh came out directly out of the savage software um they actually look a little nicer now i, I have to confess this this slide was probably generated 15 years ago um and uh his newer package makes a little prettier slides but these are uh these are just excel graphs but they're they're being built out of his package and essentially what you end up with is you end up with the uh, predicted project time on the x-axis and you can generate the cumulative frequencies from the uh, individual frequencies for the y-axis simply by creating a third column and, and basically summing the, the individual probabilities right as you as you keep going down so you can build these by hand all three of the packages generate these automatically for you Excellent. Uh, another question, people are asking if the slides will be available. Just so everybody's aware, what I'll do is once I edit the YouTube recording, I'll upload that to the YouTube channel in a week or two, and I'll post a link for the slide deck along with that video. That way anybody can share it and download that content. Uh, the next question I have here, just, Dave. Just real quick, uh, Chris, yep. I, I, I would offer to, if, if anybody you know is really anxious to get started, just drop me an email, I'll send you a copy of the slides. That's not a problem at all. Excellent. Uh, the next question, it says another type of simulation is discrete event simulation. To answer the question, how big a production line do I need? What would the benefits and drawbacks of using a Monte Carlo simulation versus discrete event simulation? Do you want me to repeat that? Uh, no, I, I think I think I've got it. Um, if you're trying to, if you're trying to understand how work moves through your line, you probably want to use discrete event simulation. Uh, anytime you're dealing with queues uh, and things having the potential to, you know, wait for service and things like that, that's really a discrete event problem. Uh, here what we're looking at is kind of a, almost a higher level, right? Uh, if, if you are trying to figure out how big to build the plant, the Monte Carlo is, is the way to go, I think, as, as I, we talked about. If you're trying to figure out how to build it that big, that's where the discrete event comes in. So if you know you really want to build a plant that makes 110 widgets per month but you don't really know if you can do that that's where discrete event simulation would come in that's where you'd have to look at okay here's what my process looks like uh here are the bottlenecks here's where things wait here's where things run in parallel and you know maybe i need five of these machines instead of four to get to 110 a month from my current hundred or whatever that's a discrete event problem Excellent. The next question we have, it says, 
So cumulative frequency is probability of occurrence, question mark. Yeah, it, well, cumulative is, is I mean, the, the word cumulative is what it says. Is it, it's the, the cumulative. Let me go back to the slide again. So if you look at, at uh, this distribution of project times, the the leftmost one is 13.3, and that looks like it's going right into zero. So nothing happened in less than 13.3 weeks. Um, let's just jump. Let's look at big chunks here because it's easier, I think, to try to talk about. If I go to 14.3, let's say that happened 5% of the time. Well, 3% of the time. It's kind of hard to interpolate here, right? But you can get it to draw better axes too. That's the beauty of Excel, right? You can just tell it, I want to see this bigger or with finer granularity or whatever. Um, so that took 5% of the time. We go to 15.3, how often did that happen? Well, it's the difference between 15.3, which looks like about 15%, and 14.3, which looks like about 3%, right? So that's 12%. So if, if these were discrete and not, you know, lots of points in between, basically you take each of the probabilities and you just keep adding them in. So as you go up the curve, you get closer to 100%. And by the time you get to the last data point and you add its individual probability in, you've accounted for 100%. So one of the ways to read this, one of the helpful ways is to take, take a number like 16.3, come up to the line and come across, it looks like about 45%. What that says is that 45% of the time, under these conditions, I would expect the project to take less than or equal to 16.3 weeks. That's what a cumulative frequency is all about. And so it's always, the statement is always less than or equal to whatever particular point you're looking at. So if I, conversely, if I wanted to be 95% positive that I'd be within my estimated completion time, I'd run up this, this graph to the 95% line, drop down, and it looks like it's somewhere between 18 and 19 weeks. And again, you, you have the underlying data here. You could figure that out more exactly. This, this hasn't graphed a lot of points on the x-axis. But those are the ways you can use that. So, and 95% is a, a fairly common confidence interval to be able to say, you know, I want to be 95% certain that I'm going to either meet or exceed my, my goal. Excellent. That was a great description. Um, I, have, I have what some of these mathematicians are probably going to think is a silly question. Is there a special name for this chart that we're looking at here? Is there a specific name for this type of chart? It's, it's in statistics parlance, it would be called a cumulative distribution function. That's what it would be called. So, um, Because I, I, you know, I see where that would be very useful. That's why I'm asking. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and sometimes you'll see this overlaid with the probability distribution. I don't know, some people I'm sure have probably seen, and you, you can probably tell by the shape of this curve that this is pretty normally distributed. If you were to put the probability distribution on this chart too, you would see the typical normal distribution that dotted that dashed, uh, dashed dotted line that's vertical is, is the mean. And so you would see a symmetric distribution about that. And really all we're doing in, in mathematical terms is summing the area from left to right under the distribution curve, the, the, the normal curve you're used to seeing, and plotting that over the same x-axis the sum over time. So it, it's almost like doing integration, right? It's, 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 it's an integral under that curve, and that's what we're showing here. Uh, you have a request. Somebody asked if you can introduce the triangular function in your example, such as triangular 456.5. Uh, 
okay? So what this is, this first one, four, five, six point five. These are the, the three points it takes to define a triangular distribution. Let's go back and look at a picture of one. I had a picture here somewhere. There we go. So the third one down is the triangular distribution. And as you can see, it's just a symmet – well, in this case, it's a symmetric. We'll see it in just a second. It doesn't have to be. But it's a probability distribution that shows the likelihood of any given region under that, that uh, distribution. Now, this is a continuous distribution, right? So, you know, depending on how statistically we want to get here, right, the, the probability of any single point here is zero. Right, because the the integral of a single point has no has no uh, has no width, but for any arbitrarily small non-zero interval, we can figure out the probability of being in that range, and that's what this is. So if this were the four, five, six point five one or whatever, the four would be the left point where it crosses the x-axis on the left. The five would be the high point in the middle. And the 6.5 would be the point on the right where it crosses the x-axis again. And by being 4, 5, 6.5, I think you could see that it's one unit from the left to the center, and it's 1.5 units from the center to the right. So this is going to have a longer tail on the right, which translated the other way, it says that our average estimate or our most likely estimate, which is the peak, is optimistic because it's skewed to the left in the distribution. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's see. There's another question here. It says, in the critical path example, the triangle model uses three points. Can you elaborate on the process to define each of those values beyond the listed estimate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a, that's a really interesting question, um, and it's, it's uh, <clears throat> something that comes up fairly often. There's, there's really a couple of ways to do this. One way is to go back to your historical data and, and say, okay, every time we've had a project where we've done this task, these are the times that it took. Sometimes, sometimes it took four, sometimes it took four and a half, sometimes it took seven, blah, blah, blah. Take all those, put them together, figure out what the distribution looks like. If triangular will work, you can use it. If it looks like it's more uh, skewed or more uh, like the log normal, you might have to do that. It might be uniform. It's, it's, you know, it, it's going to be what your data uh, your data really tell you. That to me is kind of the ideal case. If you've got historical data, you've done these things in the past. The reality is, at least in this particular area of doing project planning, I find that a lot of companies don't have that data. And so then you end up using another approach that we've used in the past. You go to subject matter experts and you and you get them to give you estimates for the fastest you think it could be done under ideal conditions, the longest you think it would take when things aren't going so well, and the amount of time you think it ought to take most of the time. And the more of those that you can get and aggregate and put together and try to see if there's some consensus, the better off you'll be. Um, it's still more insight than you've got by having the, the subject matter experts say, oh, it ought to take you two weeks. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a getting good input data can be quite a challenge sometimes. Great answer. Uh, this is more of a comment, but um, I'll, I'm using my personal computer for this call tonight. Uh, if I was using my work computer, I have a VPN that's always on. Somebody commented that if you're calling in and you're on your VPN, it may cause audio issues due to the latency with the VPN. So I'm, I'm just putting that out there. If you have a VPN, you can turn it off or uh, use a computer without it, it. It would help with the audio issues that some people are having. I think there's one last question here, Dave. It says, without simulation tools, can we estimate 
assuming normal distribution and the standard deviation. Like say you didn't have an add-on for your computer. Or say if I was using my work computer that was locked down, I couldn't install an add-on software for it. What, what, what do we do in that case? Uh, that's an interesting question. I'd have to think through this a little bit more, but my here, here's what's on the top of my head right now. Um, first of all, is it's it's the interaction effects and the nonlinearities that cause all the not all but a lot of the issues, and those are going to be really hard to try to capture in all the different ways that they can occur. Um, for for a simple model, you might be able to do some of that, but I think you're still going to find once you get past three or four inputs, it's going to be quite a challenge. It really is. Um, it's sometimes very surprising the shapes of some of these curves, and uh, one of the one of the things we didn't really talk about tonight, but the the overall general shape gives you a very good insight into the risk that's involved. And when I say risk, I mean the the uncertainty. If this this little picture we're seeing down the bottom right hand corner here that we've looked at a couple of times now. If that's real steep, in other words, that S curve is fairly flat on the ends and fairly steep in the middle, it says that that's fairly low risk. In other words, all the outcomes are fairly close to each other. Um, if that's really flat and elongated, it says there's a, quite a bit of risk and the outcomes are basically all over the place, right? Um, these don't always come out nice, smooth S-shaped curves. It's partly because of the fact that all the distributions were triangular here. Um, so uh, it, it would be a challenge, I think, to try to come up with good estimates, as good estimates by trying to back into it uh, algebraically, so to speak, right? Um, I'm not aware of anybody that's tried to do this. This has gotten so easy to do. Interestingly enough, I didn't talk about this, uh, Monte Carlo was invented back in the 40s uh, under the under the uh, football stadium at the University of Chicago. Uh, it was first thought of and used in the development of the first atomic bomb. Uh, so it's been around for a while, and I can promise you they weren't using high-speed computers back then. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's gotten so ubiquitous and so easy to do. Um, that I, I, I'd, I'd bend over backwards to try to find a way, especially when there's you know a package like Savages out there that's free, um, and it's it's literally it's an Excel plugin. Uh, you load it from Excel. Uh, I'd be surprised if the systems were so locked down that you couldn't add a plugin. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not possible, but um, you know I'm aware of couple of clients that, you know, have locked down environments, we still are able to load plugins. Excellent. Another excellent answer and explanation. You know, it's, it's funny. It kind of reminds me when I first took a statistical software analysis class and the teacher asked me, how do you make a Pareto chart? And I was the wise guy. I said, oh, you just go to the charts in Excel and it's a function in there that does it. Um, I, <laughs> there's no more questions from the, from the audience. But I, I do have one last one that I wrote down. Uh, you know, I know you worked at IBM for a long time. When you had those low-speed laptops, were you actually using a 5155 portable? <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we had a number of years that, you know, when laptops were first becoming popular, that to take a large spreadsheet with lots of formulas and try to, Execute it 10,000 times, you know, it was an all day event. And uh, now these things, they, they just, the answers just jump right back out at you. It's pretty amazing. Excellent, Dave. It's been a great presentation. Uh, you have numerous compliments on the sidebar. Uh, I think I've gone through all of the questions so far. I'm just double checking here. Uh, we really appreciate the webinar that you presented tonight. As I said, Earlier, this will be recorded. Once I download it and compress it, it'll get uploaded to YouTube in a week or two. We'll also put the link 
for the presentation. Uh, you can also reach out to Dave. Uh, just do a quick search, Catskill Analytics on Google. His website will come up. Uh, we appreciate everybody for calling in. We had 65 to 70 participants tonight, and it's a pretty good turnout. Uh, we know everybody's been stuck at home, so we're going into month four of the COVID. So everybody stay safe out there. Once again, uh, I'll be signing out to the ASQ Inspection Division. Thanks, everybody, for spending this hour with us tonight. If there's any final questions, you can always get those to us via email. Thank you very much, Dave. All right. Thank you. Good night, all.